I'm going to be speaking from something a little bit touchy tonight. Um, and although this message has been said multiple times over multiple occasions, I'm sure you've heard different perspectives on it. I'm sure you've heard different stories of it. I'm going to try to convey something to you from a different perspective. Um, and tonight, after you leave here, my goal is that you would leave here with a different mindset, that you would put yourself in check. I'm going to be talking about the parable of the seed, and once we leave from here, my goal is for you to think, which seed am I? So many times we look at it from the perspective of the one planting the seed, but we don't look at the perspective of the one who is the seed. And it won't be something easy to do. It's not going to be an easy thing to judge yourself over, but if you're being practical and real with yourself and open-minded to the Holy Spirit, you will leave here convicted and wanting to repent and wanting to change, myself included. So I'm going to ask you to stand up for the reading of God's Word. I'll be reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, and I'll be reading from verse 3 to verse 20. I'll be in the New Living Translation if you want to follow. It says, Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed, and as he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on the shallow soil with underlining rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wiltered under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among the thorns and grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. Still other seed fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Later, when Jesus was alone with his 12 disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him, what does the parable mean? He replied, you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God, but I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, If you can't understand this meaning of the parable, how will you understand all the other parables? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away, and as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing in God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Amen. I ask you to take your seat respectfully. So tonight I'm going to be talking about four seeds. I'm not going to be talking about from the perspective of how we plant a seed. Rather, I'm going to be talking from the perspective of being the seed ourselves. So there are four seeds and four types of soil, if you want to look at it that way. In other words, there are four types of people. And my question to you, and the title of my message tonight is, Which seed are you? The first one we're going to look at is at the seed that fell on the footpath. And in verse 15, you'll see the emphasis on this. It's those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. This seed is the one that falls on calloused hearts. This is a seed where people are in the church. Maybe they come into a service, they hear the word, and they might even think, hmm, that was a really good message. That was something really good and practical that I took with me. But as soon as they walk out, because their hearts are hardened, they walk back to the same lifestyle that they had before with no change. And many of us can see ourselves in that position or might even see family members, loved ones, brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters and as I was getting ready for the message, I tend to get worried on how to start a message. I, I see myself in the middle, I see myself in the end of the message, but I don't know how to start a message. So I asked someone's advice, I said, how can I start a message? And he said, start with a story or something practical. 
I don't have a story for you. <laughs> but I took that perspective and I said, okay, I'll try to do something else. Instead, I will try to give my testimony how in my points of life, I was at every seat. At a point in my life, I was in the seat that fell on the road. At one point in my life, I was the seed that fell on the rock. At one point in my life, I was a seed that fell between the thorns and got choked out. And at another point, I was at a seed that grew and sprouted. I want you to think about your sons or daughters, specifically. Many of you have those people in your life or have sons and daughters, have a father or mother, have someone that hears the word, yet they continually reject the word of God because their hearts are hardened. They have become callous. The hearts are no longer thriving. It's no longer excited for the word of God. It's no longer pumping the way it used to pump. They come in, they might hear a word, and they might hear a good word and say, that was a great word. But they walk out and they go back to the same sin. It's like Peter, in Second Peter, he talks about this, and he says it's like a dog returning to vomit. He says it's like a pig who returns to the mud. And so many times we find ourselves, I find myself, well, we take something good, but yet we go back and dirty ourselves. We jump back into the mud. We, we go back and lick our vomit and go back to the same problems and the same trash that we were part of before because something is hardened in our hearts. That's because Satan came and stole the seed, the seed that was planted on us. It says that the birds came and ate him. And that's what Satan does when we plant a seed because our hearts are hardened, because we refuse to listen to the word of God. That's when Satan comes and plucks it out. In order for us to have any depth, any growth, we would have to have our hearts and our minds open and receptive. And to come to a place in our life where we humble ourselves and say, God, I'm willing to hear your word. It's a problem of humility. It's a problem of not willing to open up our hearts and say, God, I want to hear more from you. God, I want to hear your word. I want change in my life. I I come in here, I hear the word, but I, I find myself going back to the same trash I was doing before. You're accustomed to that sin and there's no longer any conviction, but you are not bothered by hearing the message. You have a lack of conviction. You come in. You might even say, I I want to hear the message. It might make me feel good for the next 30 minutes, but I know as soon as I leave, I'm going to go back to my old life. And to share an example and share a testimony of part of my life, that's how I was. There was a moment in my life where I turned my face from the Lord. There was a moment in my life where I said, God, I don't want to be next to you. But I would still find myself somehow walking into church. I can still be influenced by the world. I still had problems in me and the sin that was lurking with me, in me. I might not have been even there all in my mind. But I came and I sat down and I listened to the word of God thinking, maybe something will spark up. But as soon as I left, I went right back to my vomit. Nothing else changed. Nothing else looked different in my life than the way I walked in. So I'm asking you, are you the seed that has fallen on the path, on the road? Are you the one where the bird comes and steals the seed? Or or do you know someone in your life that's there now? What are you doing about it? What are you doing about the one, the son or the daughter, who comes in to hear the word but returns back to the vomit and returns back to the mud? Are we not crying out to God, Lord, heal our family? Lord, heal my son. Lord, heal my daughter. Change their mindset. The word of God says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened towards God, but I believe our prayers will soften the hearts of our children and of our families if we cry out to God. The second one I want to look at is a seed that fell on shallow soil. Sorry, I'm not used to PowerPoint, so I totally just skipped these last two. Hardened hearts and no conviction. You saw that. The seed that fell in shallow soil between rocks. I'm not going to try to say it in Romanian. You can try to read that. It might work better for you. They hear the message and receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they do not last long. And this is where I just want to focus on for a minute. This soil, I believe, this soil is the soil of testing of fire. If you are the seed that falls on this soil, be prepared to be tested by the Holy Spirit. You say, God, I love you. God, I want to follow you. God, I want to give you my heart. God, I want all the things that you have for me, yet I'm not willing to be tested. 
And we look at an example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if you turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, you'll see a perspective that I want to share with you. It says this in verse 16 of chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But focus right here. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know and make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. What is the fire that you are being tested in? Because as we see from the example that Jesus portrayed to his disciples, he said, this seed fell among short soil. So when trials and temptations, when fire came to challenge what they were saying, they withered away. They didn't grow. There wasn't any soil deep enough. The roots were moved. Life problems or persecutions for God's word causes our downfall. When was the last time that you were persecuted for being a Christian? When was the last time that you were tested through trial, through fire, through examination to see if your motives were real? And what I picture, even with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is like they're saying, God, we're willing to give you everything. We're willing to love you. We will die for you. And it's as if God says, really? Do you really mean that? Are you, are you serious about that? Because if I test you, will you pass the test? And we see that example with the Apostle Peter, right? Lord, I'll go to the cross with you. I'll die with you. And what happens? He scatters and there's no disciples left at at that point when Jesus goes to the cross. His roots weren't deep enough. Our roots might not be deep, deep enough. I ask you tonight, are your roots deep enough? If you were tested right now, would you be able to withstand the test? And if not, what are you doing to withstand the test? You might be going through a sickness in the family. There might be cancer in your parents. There might be a sickness over your children. There might be a financial problem or or marital problem that you're asking God, I don't see breakthrough in it. Are you willing to say, God, I trust you and I love you no matter what, and I'm going to fight through this? Or do you just walk away when things get hard? And back to an example of my life. Again, years after that first experience. I dedicated myself again to the Lord. I know you guys have been there too where you've done it multiple times. God, I'm with you now. I'm with you. I'm willing. I don't want to go back to my vomit. I'm willing to change. And this time, the Lord says, okay, let me see if you're real. I'm going to put you in the furnace. I'm going to put you in the fire. I'm going to see what you're all about. I'm going to see if you're real. And when trials and temptations came, I caved and I said, Lord, I can't do this. And I walked away. When I was persecuted for my faith with my friends, all my friends that were still in the world, and I was trying to change my life and trying to be different, and they saw the way I was living, because of my persecution, I easily fell back and said, no, I, I want you guys. I was brought back to the life, and again, I went back down because my roots were not deep enough. Are your roots deep enough, church? Are your roots deep? When was the last time you were tested in fire? And if you were tested through that fire, would you be able to sustain? We look at an example from Paul. If you can put up Romans 8.35. Paul talks about the love of Christ. He says, but if not, oh, that's still Daniel 3. Sorry. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution Famine, nakedness, peril, sword. No, I can keep going on. It will say nothing will separate you from the love of God. Not your financial crisis, not your sickness, not the problems going on in your school, not your friends' problems, not the abortions going on. Nothing will separate you from Christ's love. And it's as if Christ wants to turn the other cheek and say it to you now and say, okay, you see that my love will withstand all things. Now I want to see if your love will withstand all things. If I put you through the test, will you be able to respond the same way? God, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what distress, no matter what persecution, no matter what's going on, I still choose to love you. And to examine yourself, ask yourself the question, what testing am I in? And if I am in a test, whether it be a sickness or finances or friendship, what what are you going through? And are your roots deep enough? If you turn with me to the book of Job, I'm going to read from chapter 1, verse 18 to 22. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. 
Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. But suddenly a powerful wind swept in front from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Job stood up. He tore his robe in grief. He shaved his head and he fell to the ground to worship. And he said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will go naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise be the name of the Lord. Are we able to get to that point in our life? Or do we easily fall away when trial and temptation come against us? And it reminds me of what Frater de Mishka was saying earlier. When those trials come, where do you run? Do you run to the bar? Do you run to talk trash on someone else? Do you run to a person who's also going through, through trouble who doesn't know how to respond to you? Or do you run to your closet? Do you close the door behind you? Like I said in Matthew 6, I shut it behind me and the God who I'm praying to will hear me. Are you running to him with your problems? Who are you running to? Where is your hope? And who do you trust? John 16, Jesus says very clearly, in this life, you'll have many trouble, many troubles. But do not worry, I've overcome the world. It's really simple. If we're willing to endure the temptation, the trial, just like it says in James 1, verse 12, patient endurance is what you need now, right? And then he will give you a crown of life to those who have been through testing. Where is your endurance? And I just want to show a picture. Your roots are your endurance. I don't know how many of you are from the East Coast, but I'm sure you've heard of hurricanes. And I, was, I don't know why, I was just thinking as I was prepping, I was like, God, what, what example do you want me to give? And I felt him just tell me, look up palm trees. Look up hurricanes and palm trees. Palm trees are very skinny, they're very tall, they look like nothing. It looks like it has no power, and yet there's a 60,000 pound vehicle flipped over next to it. And I was looking through the evidence of what a hurricane looks like. And actually, a Category 5 hurricane starts at 157 miles per hour. And I was watching this video of a man strapped, and he had a belt, and he had all these strings laying on him. And the wind was blowing on him, and he was about to fall over, and his face was peeling back. He was at 157 miles an hour. He just wanted to reach Category 5 to see what it looks like. And I looked at this, and I, 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 I don't know why I was just thinking about it. I said, look, look at this truck, this fat truck. Many of us look like this fat truck. Many of us look really good on the outside. We wear a kostum when we speak. We wear a tie to church. We say, God bless you, brother, praise the Lord. But when wind comes against us, we're that truck. We fall over. Our roots come out of the ground because there's not deep enough from the beginning. But when you look like that palm tree, here's one more image. I love this one even more because you can see in the background, some of them are tilted over, some of them are bent over, some of them are pushed, yet they're all still standing. And the picture that I thought of was, that's why I went to Daniel, I thought of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I thought of th three scrawny guys because if you read in Daniel 1, Daniel talks about, Lord, and he, he talks about to the king, he says, let us just eat vegetables and let me prove to you that we're stronger. I know they were stronger, but I still picture like these scrawny little boys. I picture like kids who are 120 pounds, right? But yet when they're thrown in the fire, they look like palm trees. If you look back in Daniel chapter 3, if you turn with me one more time. Sorry, I lost my bookmark. It says this, and every time I read this, I, I, I can't help but tear up. It's in verse 25. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. And Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. That's why we sing that song, There is Another in the Fire. The Lord is with you in the fire if you're willing to withstand the fire. My question to you tonight, are you that palm tree? 
The third one I want to look at is the seed that fell among the thorns. They hear the word of God, but the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things crowd out the message. I find myself currently in this situation. I'll be vulnerable with you. I'm not the one planting seed and having to harvest a 30, 60, or 100 fold. I'm the one who's worried about the, the things of this world. I'm the one who tries to build something up for myself because I don't see the outcome of next week. I'm the one who gets distracted with other things. And the cares of this world is the anxiety of what's going on. It's the anxiety of what you're going through right now. What cares are going on in you right now that is distracting you from the Lord? Is it finances? I can, I can probably say that 90% of us in here are distracted by finances, right? We are always worried, Lord, when is that next paycheck going to come? How am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to pay for school? How am I going to help my kids? How am I going to pay for their college? And we see the example of Abraham and Sarah. If you look in Genesis 16, 1 and 2, we see someone who let the cares of this world get intact with their walk with the Lord. Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. It says, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, has not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarah said to Abraham, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abraham agreed with Sarah's proposal. But we look back right before that and it said God promised him. God said, Abraham, just look up. And we were at camp last week and we saw thousands of stars and Emma was talking about it. But you just look up and you see the thousands of stars that were out there and you can see what what God was telling Abraham. God, I'm going to multiply your generation. I'm going to multiply your seed. But the cares of this world got entangled with him. And even though God spoke to him, he ignored it. And he went and he created his own success. He built himself a promise. What cares are you going through right now in life? Maybe you're out of work. Maybe your kids are sick. Maybe your family is sick. The cares of this life cause you to doubt God's nature. The cares of this life cause you to doubt God's nature. Psalm 25, 3 says, those who put their trust in the Lord will never be put to shame, will never be disgraced. I hope we all trust in the Lord in this church. I like to say amen too, but sometimes I don't. Do you always trust in him? I'm asking you sincerely, do you always trust in him? Ask yourself, Or do I entangle myself with the cares of the world and the anxieties and the things that come against me and the problems that I have and I say, God, now I got to manifest something because I'm not trusting you. I got to start a business. I got to go over here and sell this thing. I got to start something because the promises that you gave me, they're not good enough. And the timing that you gave me, they're not good enough. So I'm going to do what Abraham and Sarah did and I'll have a better blessing. Is that what happened in the word? Those who wait upon the Lord will not be put to shame. Those who trust in him will not be put to shame. And I want to give this great example. Uh, We were at camp last week in Yosemite. We had a great time, Colleen. Too bad for you. Um, (laughs) But we were on this bridge. Like We were looking for a river to swim in and to jump off of, and and God aligned it perfectly. And we were sharing testimonies on Friday night. And Maya Podobia came up, and she gave probably the most awesome testimony I've ever heard in my life. And it was something I'll take to the grave. I don't know if she's in here, but I loved what she said. She said this. She said she was standing on the bridge with a bunch of girls. And she was getting ready to jump off, but she was scared. And her testimony on Friday night went something like this. I pictured the bridge as my worries, my anxieties, my fears, my problems. And I pictured the water as God's hand. And I jumped off the bridge knowing that he's going to catch me. I can stop the sermon right here. Does that make sense? And she said in those three or four seconds underwater, it was the most peace she's ever had in her life because she knew all her cares and worries were in the hands of God. When was the last time you got to that place where you said, God, I'm jumping off the bridge? 
into the water and I'm not going to look to my left or to my right and I'm going to trust that your hand has me and I'm no longer going to be entangled by the cares of this life because we move into the lure of wealth. That's the next point. We become ungrateful for the blessings that God's already provided for us and we aren't satisfied with our own blessings. We always want more and more and more. God, you gave me what I wanted but I'm not satisfied with that anymore. It's like giving a child a toy. I'm sure you parents know what that's like. You give them a toy, and how long do they like that toy? Then they want something else. But they wanted that thing for so long. I, re I remember going to my parents when I was small, like a Game Boy or something, and I'd pull out the reclama, and I'd like circle it and highlight it, and I'd, I'd want that thing. And eventually, if they were to buy me that thing, I loved it, but then the next week I wanted something else. And it's that same mindset that we come before God where our ungratefulness takes over the blessing of God already in our life. Let me give you an example. How many of us in this church want to work harder just to keep up with other people? God, I'm no longer satisfied with my Toyota Camry. I need to work an extra 40 hours this week so I can buy a BMW and watch this person next to me. I'm just being real. How many of us are not satisfied with a 40-hour work week and instead of going back home to our families, I'm going to spend an extra 20, 30 hours just to build up more money, bigger house, bigger stuff, bigger cars, bigger yachts, bigger vacations because I want to keep up with other people or I'm not satisfied with my season of blessing that's been until now. And you're willing to jeopardize your family because of that? We work with the youth. And I can tell you honestly that youth would be completely transformed if they had parents who just did one-on-ones with them and spent more time with them. I'm not saying this to put you down. You're a good church and you're doing great work with your kids. But if you put out that 20 hours of extra work and you spent a coffee date with your daughter and you let her be open with you and talk about her problems with you, you will see a transformation not only in them but in your grandkids and the generations to follow. Let me ask you a question. Do you have what you need? 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12. If you can put that up real quick, I'm just going to read that. I'm running out of time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Aspire to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your hands as we commanded you. Period. Mind your own business. Work hard with your hands. Be grateful for what you have. And don't overdo it. God, I have what I need. I have food on the table. I have a roof over my head. I'm satisfied and I'm grateful for what I have. I'm no longer going to let the lure of wealth take me away from you. And the other cares of the world. Other things. And that's where you look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. And, and the leader comes to Christ and he says, Lord, I'll do whatever you want. I'll follow you. Jesus said, do you even know what you're asking me? Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head tonight. Some of us are going to go to a warm shower tonight, a warm bed, and go to sleep. And it's as if Jesus is saying, I literally have nothing. You're still willing to follow me? Do you understand how much blessing we have? I'm running out of time, so I'd just like to close out with my last point. The seed that fell on fertile soil. They hear and accept the word of God and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Most of us in this church believe we're in this category. I don't believe so. They hear and accept the word of God. Many of us hear and accept the word of God. Many of us hear it, rejoice in it, sit down, get fed on Sundays, get fed from the service. But look at that red, red word right there. And, and produce a harvest. Where is your harvest? If someone points their finger to you and says you by name, can they point to something that you are producing in this church or in life that is fruitful? I was speaking with my grandpa earlier this week. I noticed because my finger's pointing at you. He said, remember, if you're pointing at them, you have four more pointing at you. Where is the fruit in my life? And someone came to me this, this week and they rebuked me in Jesus' name. You know what they said? They said, Andrew, what happened to you? 
I remember you the way that you used to pray. You would pray and things would shake and move. You would lay hands and people would get healed. Where is that desire and longing in you? What happened to you? And what I did when I walked away is not, not that I think of, hey, they're just trying to make things up. What I said to myself is, why did it take three years for someone to rebuke me? Why did it take three years for someone to correct me for something that I was doing wrong? Where is my passion? Where is my fruit? In Psalm chapter 1, we see, I think Luciano was talking about it a couple weeks ago. And he said this. It says, the tree that is planted by the water produces fruit when? Every season. I'm sure many of you have roshi in your backyard. Raise your hand if you have roshi or some type of zarzarvatur in your, in your backyard. Okay. If not, Frater Jiga has enough for everyone. Don't worry. If that fruit is produced, all right? We had some really good tomatoes this year. If that fr fruit is produced, that's great. But what happens if three, four, five years after that it says, now nah, I don't want to create any more fruit now. Maybe on the sixth year I'll come back. Would you still keep that vine in your backyard? What would you do with it? And this is what the psalmist is saying, that the, the harvest of the fruit is produced every single harvest. And this is what, what the Lord is asking us through this. And produces a harvest. You cannot accept God's word without also producing fruit. I say I'm a Christian. I sit down here and I receive. Where are your actions to prove what you believe? And to finish, are you a tree that produces fruit? Are you missing roots? Are you worried about tomorrow? Are you chasing money? Are you after other things? Ask God to plant you deep. And I pray that you would produce a harvest that's 30, 60, or 100 fold. May God bless you.